once in a generation, a book comes along that changes the way we think. The end of Alzheimer's program is that book. Fasten your seatbelts and get ready to listen to Dr. Dale Bredesen. Welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast. We are focused on bringing you information to help prevent from developing and improve from suffering with brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a physician and chief scientific wellness officer at Kemper Cognitive Wellness, and I'll be your guide on these sound waves. So whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have a loved one with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? You'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's, dementia, and just generally things in life's second half. If you have questions or comments, check us out on social media. To support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show if you find these episodes valuable. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back. We are honored to have with us back on the show one of the truly pioneering doctors in Alzheimer's prevention and early intervention space and largely an inspiration for this show in general. Uh, for the folks that are unfamiliar, Dr. Dale Bredesen has had a long and illustrious career as a neuroscientist, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's researcher. He has made several original contributions to the field of basic and clinical neuroscience and has been a leader in many ways uh, beyond his lab. In 2014, as many of you know, he published a landmark paper on reversal of cognitive decline in 10 individuals. And since then, has gone on to write a New York Times bestseller and developed training programs for clinicians and individuals all around the world, no doubt bringing hope and help to those suffering from Alzheimer's and its precursors. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bredesen. Thanks so much for having me, Nate. Great to be back. So you published a new book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. Um, congratulations. So we know that's uh, no small feat and a lot of work. Thanks very much, Nate. Yeah, so after the first book uh, came out, we had a lot of people who said, well, this is all well and good. Great to hear about the research and great to hear that there's hope here, but we'd really like more specific information. You know, what are the URLs and where do you go to buy things? And, you know, what are the doctors you interact with? And what are the things that you do? Where do, what do you buy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I wanted to get the second one out to address those issues, to address the very things that are causing the problem. Uh, and to, to get it so that people knew exactly where to go, what to do, et cetera. And so I'm actually really excited because I worked with two very complementary people on a handbook part. So the handbook is part of this new book, and it goes into great detail on all these things. But as a person who spent you know most of my life in a laboratory and running a laboratory, uh, I didn't feel as if I could give some of the best uh, help for some of these things. So I wanted to work with someone who's doing this every day and getting great results. And of course, that's Julie G, who's one of the co-authors on the handbook part of this. And then my wife, uh, Dr. Aida Lachine Bredesen, who is an integrative physician. And so the idea there is we really have three very different skill sets all bringing together uh, kind of a best product so that people can can get the best uh, outcome. And it's great to hear from, for example, from Julie for what's working for her and what's not working for her and what sort of workarounds she's found. And then from Aida on you know, various things that are clinically relevant. And then I tried to put in the, you know, the mechanisms from the biochemistry side. Yeah, they're, they're awesome. Uh, Julie G, of course, was a guest on the show. Uh, a couple Great. of years ago, and uh, it is uh, amazing. Um, so no, no doubt, many of our listeners have heard of your work or familiar with your work. But just for review's sake, can you rev sort of give us the basic idea of your philosophy that gave rise to the End of Alzheimer's and now the End of Alzheimer's Program book? Absolutely. So we spent... 30 years looking at one question, which is, could we understand the fundamental nature of the neurodegenerative process? And I think this is where, you know, we've had some disagreement with others in the field. Uh, the, the field has argued over the years that we should go ahead and get drugs and that some drug is going to be out there that's going to work. And of course, they haven't. They're, even the best of the, of the effects of the drugs have been very, very modest. So we wanted to start from ground zero and ask the question in the laboratory, 
what are the molecular pathways that are driving this process? And why does you know, why is Alzheimer's so common? Why has it been so difficult to treat? And then we wanted to take those data and see if we could translate them into an you know, actionable clinical program. And if no surprise, perhaps, the conclusions we came to from the research were strikingly different than the approach that people had been taking with, you know, let's get the next drug, let's get the next removal of amyloid. And the, the research really suggests something completely different. Whereas we're told that this is a disease of misfolded proteins, or this is a disease of amyloid or a disease of tau. What the research suggests is that the reason you're actually losing these synapses is not for any of those. Those are all mediators. But the reason that you're actually losing the synapses is that there is a mismatch between what is required to keep your 500 trillion synapses going, and that is specific growth factors, specific hormones, specific nutrients, a lack of ongoing inflammation, a lack of toxin associated, a good vascular flow, energetics, mitochondrial function, all of these things actually contribute. And we studied APP and its specific molecular pathways for years. And APP, this amyloid precursor protein that's really at the center of this disease, is absolutely fascinating because there are dozens and dozens of things that impact it. And you can literally trace the signals, for example, from reduced estradiol. How does estradiol impact this? You know, it binds to its receptor, it enters the nucleus, it changes the transcription of hundreds of genes. And one of them happens to be the gene that cuts the APP at the site that gives you two peptides, SAPP alpha and alpha CTF, that actually support the production of new synapses and the maintenance of synapses. And at the same time, on the opposite side, this same molecule can serve as a switch also to downsize. So now if you have ongoing inflammation, for example, you activate NF-kappa B, and NF-kappa B also impacts hundreds of genes through the nucleus. And when it does that, two of them are ones that actually cut APP in a different way to produce four peptides that are all saying pull back. So what it really shows us, it gives us a new look at Alzheimer's as a protective response to any of several different fundamental insults. So really, Alzheimer's turns out to be, at its heart, an insufficiency insufficient support for the amount of insult that you have. So of course, we want to identify all of these. We want to dial down on the insults and we want to dial up on the support. And that turns out to be a simple concept, not as easy to do because of course you have to do specific lab tests. Human brains are complicated and you have to go beyond what is the standard of care in order to understand why each person has this problem. And then of course you have to optimize the support for these people if you're going to turn the ship around. Because as you know, by the time you have symptoms, you've typically had the ongoing pathophysiology for years. Yeah, so I, I, I actually... Um... I remember where I was when I, in October of 2014 when I first laid eyes on your paper. I remember where I was sitting in a car uh, listening to an, um, an interview that uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Bland had done with you from the Institute of Functional Medicine. Uh, I remember where I was sitting in Cleveland in the car when you'd start talking about diet, exercise, sleep, and stress. And I also remember traveling to the Buck Institute on Aging when you were... Uh, holding training for uh, clinicians up there you know, when I was still at Cleveland Clinic and asking in between sessions, you were kind of out in the hallway. And I remember asking you how you know if you have everything modeled, right? It's one thing if you know some, some sort of average doctor says, these are all the things that matters in Alzheimer's. It's another thing if someone who's done research in the lab of two different Nobel Prize winners and has spent a career in Alzheimer's research says, these are all the things that matter. And I remember you saying to me, Dale, like you said, it's not going to be 500 things, probably won't be 100 things. It might be 50 or something, things like that. But how do you know, because you've talked about 36 holes, 36 leaky holes, and you can't just treat one of them. You've got to address all of them like you just sort of laid out. But how do you know if you've modeled all the things that matter? Yeah, that's such a great question because, you know, one of the big problems in Alzheimer's clinical, in Alzheimer's treatment, has been that we're in a problem that is essentially a floor effect. In other words, things are so poor 
that you really you can't get people up into the dynamic range. You, you just don't see anything. You give a drug, you give another drug, you give another drug. They just keep failing. The good news is when you at least get some significant portion of the critical players and you can address those, then you start seeing people get into a dynamic range. And a great example is Julie G herself, who has, and I'm sure she talked about uh, this with you when she talked to you, uh, mm-hmm. She can now see, you know, when she adds or subtracts something, she can tell, ah, this is okay, a little better, a little worse. And of course, her ongoing cognitive scores will show it uh, so that you don't have to have every single thing. I think that's the key piece. You have to have enough to move the needle so that you can begin to see an effect. And we see it again and again and again. And then once you're there, now you can look to see, and we've learned a lot since we first did this. Back, the first patient came in in 2012, and as you mentioned, we published that first paper back in 2014, and then a paper with 100 documented improvements in 2018. Uh, so, uh, and actually, uh, you were a co-author on that paper. So the, mm-hmm. the bottom line is, if you can get people into, into a dynamic range, then you can begin to see what is being missed. When we very uh, first had this, we didn't know about the type 3, the toxic people. But we noticed that there was a group of people that looked and acted different than the others. And so we started looking at, well, what is, what's going on here? Is there something we've missed? And it turned out that these people had all sorts of toxic exposures, some of them metals, some of them air pollution, some of them organics, some of them biotoxins. Uh, but they all had that in common. So we learned something new. And obviously, the, the, the ultimate uh, you know, the ultimate proof of the pudding here is to make them better. And in fact, if they don't get better if you don't address those various toxins. So that taught us something new about this disease. We're learning more about what energetics are critical. And obviously, you set up recently a very nice talk on uh, on methylene blue. Maybe this is going to be part. We know that ketones are very helpful. We know that oxygenation is more important than we thought it was originally. Um, we know that cerebral blood flow is huge. And we know that people that are you know, that are dropping their oxygenation at night are at increased risk. As we begin to address all of these things, we can see where the holes are and what's missing and what, you know, what actually helps it. And ultimately, the hope is, you know, we're kind of asymptoting out on what are the critical things. And yes, you know, it may turn out to be another five or 10. We'll see. But we know it can't be too many uh, because so many people, especially early on, do so well. If we were missing major things, then a lot of the people who would be early on would simply not respond. And the main problem right now, as you know, is the people who are very late in the course. And that's what we need to understand better. How can we address the people who are late in the course? We've had some wonderful examples of people who have responded, even with MOCA scores of zero. But those are the exceptions rather than the rule. Whereas the ones who are at the very beginning and I should say the very beginning, you know, you have 10 years of SCI typically and a couple of years of MCI. So you really have a huge window. And the people with SCI and early MCI tend to respond very, very well. So I just want to thank you for that answer. I just want to sort of clarify a few definitions. Just sure. presume most of our listeners are, are familiar with this, but SCI being subjective cognitive impairment and MCI being mild cognitive impairment. And I always and I have to speak about this. I always talk about mild cognitive impairment. When you look at the trajectory of essentially brain damage, mild cognitive impairment is a very um, misleading term. It's tremendous, profound amount of brain damage that shows up as mild because I mean, really people are testing abnormal on a test, but they haven't lost any independence yet. I mean, how, how, how do you define at this point subjective cognitive impairment versus mild cognitive impairment? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and you know, it is one of the reasons that, you know, as we look at this, we find that everything is upside down. Everything is backwards in the standard of care in this field because it's come from a situation in which people said, yeah, when you get older, you get demented. It's just old age. And so then they started looking at this end stage problem where people got severe dementia and they say, okay, this is Alzheimer's, but it has plaques and tangles. It's really a pathological definition. And then uh, people started looking and saying, well, wait a minute, before you get that, you do seem to have this more mild problem. Well, as you said, that mild problem is late stage cognitive decline. And so the definitions are that you have a, a period that is first, you have a pre-symptomatic period. So it's really, you can think of this as four phases. 
a pre-symptomatic period where already, if you look at a PET scan or cerebrospinal fluid, there are clear abnormalities there, but you still are essentially not noticing any symptoms, any problems. Then that goes on to SCI, as you said, subjective cognitive impairment, which by the way, lasts about 10 years. Those are nice studies out of University of Kentucky. So you actually have this long window. Now, even at that point, as you said, you've lost many synapses. You notice that there is a pro- that there's a problem. Your spouse often notices. Your coworkers may even notice, but it's mild enough that when you're taking cognitive tests, you're still scoring in the normal range. Now, even that is misleading, because you know what if you're a genius and you would have scored 99th percentile, and now you're scoring at the 50th percentile, and they say, oh, you're normal, so you only have SCI. Well, that's really a misunderstanding. You know, the reality is. Everybody with SCI really has MCI, and they're just not, the tests aren't sensitive enough to pick it up yet. So this is, as you said, where where people know there's something wrong, and it's just a question of how sensitive are your tests. Now, you, after you go through there, you ultimately become abnormal on the testing, and then you're called, by definition, MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And, you know, for example, your MOCA score may have dropped from normal, which is 28, 29, 30, people even talk about it down to 26. You know, again, that's kind of a misunderstanding. You know, you're not walking around with a 26 on your MOCA score. Um, you know, you're walking around with a 30 on your MOCA score. So that that's when people are dropping into the 27, 26, that's clearly a problem. And that goes all the way down to about 20, 22, 21, and 20 are the overlaps with full-blown Alzheimer's. And as you said, you, by definition, convert to Alzheimer's when you are beginning to fail in your activities of daily living. But again, that's very late in the course. You, you've got to lose a lot of synapses before you have that diagnosis. And so, of course, we would like people to come in either at the time of prevention, great time to come in, or at the earliest changes of SCI, when they first notice, wait a minute, something's not quite right here. I can't do what I used to do. But again, because there's been nothing, no treatment, people keep saying, ah, there's nothing you can do about it anyway, so don't bother to go in, which has been a huge problem. And we need to change that idea, make people understand there's a tremendous amount that you can do. So please either get on prevention or the earliest reversal, and we can pretty much wipe out this problem. Amazing. I just want to circle back. MOCA, you mentioned, is a Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's a, about an 8 to 10 minute tool that's done in the office. Highest score is 30 out of 30. Below 26, 26 below is, is, is considered abnormal just for some definition. So just to clarify again, um, Dale, for the most part, what you're seeing is the people that are following the end of Alzheimer's program, that kind of a, a program, mostly are getting results when they're this sort of subject, either as prevention or optimization, or once people start noticing these subjective symptoms that are not, where their cognitive screening tests or their neuropsych, their more advanced neuropsychologic tests are, are technically normal, those people responding. How about people in, my, in the mild cognitive impairment stage that where there is already a lot of loss of, of brain tissue, a lot of synapse loss, but still not full blown. Yeah. What kind of results are you seeing with the clinicians that are using this kind of uh, operating system around around the world? Yeah, great point. So the people who are in SCI, virtually all of them get better, and they typically come back to normal because the CI is you know relatively mild, even though as you say, you know the, the pathology is already there. So those people tend to do very well. The people who have MCI, many of them do well. Uh, and in fact, we see people all the time go from, you know, 20 to 25 on their MOCA or from 17 to 26, or those are the sorts of typical things. In the paper in which you were a co-author, um, the average was 4.9 increase, 4.9 points of increase. Now, typically, if you don't do anything, you actually go down, not up. So 4.9 points of increase is on top of the natural decline that you would have had. Mm. And then... Um, and then what I usually say is, you know, virtually all the SCIs, most of the MCIs, and some of the Alzheimer's. When people come in and they're down at five or seven, uh, they may or may not improve. And it depends a lot on if we can identify what's driving that. And just an example from this week, a guy who is at 10, just uh, you know, just came in. A mocha of 10? A mocha of 10. Right? Very, very right. low. So very, very low. Very low. This Usually is there's a lot of loss of independence at that point, not safe alone, typically with a score like that. Yeah. And this guy has very clearly identified problems. 
And we'll see how he does over the next couple of months, but he has every reason to improve, and I expect that he will. Uh, so we'll see. Um, as I said, we've had a few notes from people where the spouse had mochas of zero. Again, the big difference, though, is the people who have zero that improve can get back the ability to dress. They can get back the ability to speak. They can get back the ability even to email people. But they don't come back so far. They're not coming back to normal. They're not coming back to where they're at 30 again. You know, they may go from zero to five or seven or things like that, which, again, may make a huge difference in their lives. But we're missing something. And that's one of the big questions right now. What are we missing to take someone from zero and get them back to 30? Hmm. All right. You think it's possible? I do. I, I mean, it's just a question. I mean, again, it's going to happen. It's just a question of whether it's going to happen during my lifetime or not. Uh, I usually ask myself, if we don't figure it out, what is the person in the future going to do or think of that we didn't? And why didn't we figure it out? Hmm. Um, and I think we know a lot of the pathology of this disease. We know that there's massive synapse loss. So it's going to take restoring those synapses. And that may include things like stem cells and things like uh, intranasal trophic factors. I mean, actually, as I've said before, we have a tremendous armamentarium. We've always been told there's nothing you can do about this disease. We don't know what causes it, can't help it, you know, on and on. And the reality is just the opposite. We know a lot about what's causing it, and we know a lot about what to do about it. And in fact, we're getting more and more tools every day. Now, it's not perfect yet. We still, you know, just as you indicated, so we still need to do more. But I think that we will get to the point at some point where we can take people who are relatively late in the process and hopefully also people with multiple other diseases from, you know, people who have macular degeneration and people who have progressive supranuclear paralysis and Lewy, I mean, Lewy body disease. These people have already responded well. Um, so frontotemporal dementia has been a, a challenge. ALS, another challenge. So, you know, this is where things need to go. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so for absolutely. So for pe for people that are uh, following the program, uh, meaning they're giving good effort, because as um, as anyone who's uh, sort of tried and gone to someone that's practicing medicine, usually it's a functional medicine doctor or something like that, uh, that's practicing medicine this way, doing the labs, making recommendations, and supporting people in in the way that they need to be supported. So for people that are giving pretty good effort, how long does it take typically for people to see results? Yeah, it typically takes three to six months. And I think you've probably seen the same in your practice. Um, and, you know, again, there are patterns. Uh, the earlier, the better. Uh, better compliance. It's not always easy. So people who have a helpful spouse and a helpful health coach and a doctor who, who gets what's going on, those sorts of things, and doesn't doctor shop and you know be told by an expert, no, stop all this stuff. It's not going to help. Or, hey, no, you need to do this instead of that. We run into this all the time. Uh, so for in those sorts of situations, three to six months, and what I usually tell people is get on everything, get, get the protocol going, Take it one step at a time. And after you've got everything going and you are getting into ketosis and you are getting enough nocturnal oxygenation and you are healing your gut and you are doing the appropriate diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, all of those things, then once you get on all those things and things are going well, give it six months after that. If you're not getting good results by then, then you need to start in the troubleshooting part and then we need to work with you to do that. And there are, it's interesting, I, I get these issues all the time, tr you know, troubleshooting, what about this person who's not responding? I haven't run across a single one yet where they were actually doing the critical things that, that are needed. So the first question I always ask is, you know, what are your ketone levels? And the typical response is, we're not doing that, or we haven't checked it in a while, or I'm not sure, you know, things like that. And that's just the, you know, that's square one. Um, so it does, it does appear, again, the, the biochemistry teaches us a lot about this. It does appear that getting the appropriate uh, substrates you know, to the appropriate places in the appropriate amounts is actually, you know, absolutely critical for getting your best chance at a good outcome. And so it's interesting. You can kind of tell when people come in. If they're gung-ho and their spouses are gung-ho and the coach is gung-ho and they're like, we're going to do this they tend to get better. And the people who come in and say, well, you know, I've tried three other things. I'm going to try a little of this. I'm going to try it for two weeks, and then I'll probably try something else. Of course, they don't have as, as good of a chance. The other one, as you know very well, are the ones who are 
heavily affected and have major toxicity. And we still struggle um, with you know people who have very significant toxicity. And as Dr. Neil Nathan has pointed out, you know it takes years. And Joe Pizzorno, same thing. It takes years to get rid of these. I am I've been really surprised. Um, you know, after spending all this time in the lab, I've been surprised at how significant our toxic levels are and our toxic exposures. You see these people who have, you know, 10 times the, the upper limit of normal of five different toxins or 10 different toxins. It really shows how much our bodies are trying to sequester these and detox these and deal with these things for years and years and years, trying to keep you going. So to some extent, these chronic illnesses like Alzheimer's are working against the physician because they are keeping the person from coming to you for years and years and years, which makes your job much harder. Yeah, right. So you, you mentioned, I do want to circle back to detoxification uh, a little bit uh, and possibly even uh, keto, keto diet and ketones. But you mentioned three months, six months. From a physiologic perspective, does it make sense to you six months? Like, why does it take that long? Uh, why doesn't it take longer? You know, for the for the you know with 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 good effort with supplements, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training. Um, why does it take six months or three months? Like, what is what is it about the physiology that that uh, and the nervous system that that it says six months is a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, and I should say it doesn't always. Um, we've seen uh, the record that I've seen is four days where someone clearly uh, turned around in four days because they were actually off site, you know, away from the problems and doing the right things and you know, got into ketosis and did all the right things in four days and mm. already turned around. But you have to remember, this is a disease when we see the person for the first time, the ongoing pathophysiology is typically anywhere from five or 10 years to 20 years depending on how late they present. And they may have had symptoms for six months or a year or two years, but uh, they've had the pathophysiology for many years beyond that. So they've already had major, uh, a major gap, for example, in their energetics. You can see this on a PET scan for about 10 years before a diagnosis. You see this poor glucose utilization from the temporal and parietal lobes, for example, as you well know. Um, you've had the amyloid around for many years, typically. And so you've really, you're in the middle of this downsizing event. This is a major brain program that is producing this stuff. You've got ongoing activation of the innate immune system, just as you do with COVID-19. You've got ongoing inflammation. So you have to put all that to rest first. And then you have to convince the brain that, yes, you are actually allowed to come up. You're actually allowed to make synapses. You're allowed to increase your neural network once again. And the brain is, has not been doing this for years. So it's a huge, huge change in signaling, in structure, in components, in all of these things. And so you know, you, you have to look at what's, you know, what are you trying to change here? You're, before you see a change in the symptoms, you've got to see major changes in the signaling. They're, they're going, again, just as, as we saw that there is this gap between when COVID-19 cases start to go up and when the death starts to go up again, it's typically, you know, three weeks later or so. In this case, there is this delay. And the first thing I always look for is the, the, that when people stop declining, that's the first thing. And that often you'll see, you'll hear about early on. Patient zero, by the way, started noticing a change after one month, uh, but she didn't call me until three months because at first she didn't believe it. And then she kept saying, oh my gosh, wait, things are going better and better and better. And then finally called me up and said, wow, I'm, I'm doing better than I have in 20 years. So the first thing is this change where you're not declining. The second thing is that the spouse will say, hey, there are these li they'll notice little things. They'll often say, one of the most common, as you know, is they're more engaged. They're more with the program. They respond more quickly. Um, they're, they're more human again. I, I can interact with them again. Uh, they're not as vacant as they were. And then, of course, that all that portends good things. And then some bigger things start to happen, and they really start to improve their scores. You can often see this. Um, if they're doing things like Brain HQ or Elevate or things like that, you're seeing their scores improve. And then they start really noticing a difference. And then the spouse notices, wow. And what will happen is outside people will come in because the spouse is you know, there every day. Someone from outside will come in, you know, the cousin, the aunt, the uncle, whoever, and say, whoa, wait a minute. She, you know, she or he is so much better. 
Uh, so th that kind of you know that kind of tells you where things are headed. The other thing I always notice is people will often get, get into the ketosis and insulin uh, sensitivity and lose some weight. When they tell me, oh my gosh, you know, I've lost 15 or 20 pounds over the last month, I know things are typically headed in the right direction, unless there are people who started with a BMI of uh, you know, 18 or something. Smooth. They're thinner to start. Yeah. Is there a um, is there a wear off effect? You know, do people start declining again? How much look back you've now had about six eight years of of uh, sort of informal and then now more formal look back um, wear off effects? People start declining again. How long do the results hold? Yeah, that's the most important point actually. So I'm glad you brought that up. In typical treatment, as you know, if you give someone Aricept or Namenda or something, if they get a bump at all then they go right back to declining because you're not addressing the very things that are causing the decline. What we've seen with people uh, who are doing this and who have improved, and again, of course, that's not everybody, but for the people who have improved, they, they typically stay improved unless they've missed something or unless something new happens. So that's always a tip off when I hear that someone has improved and then things aren't going as well. Uh, they should, and we've had people now over eight years coming up on eight and a half years now, who have improved and stayed improved. I mean, these people would have been in nursing homes you know, long ago. <clears throat> so it, it, it can change. It's not so much a wearing off. It's either a reintroduction, a re-exposure, and as you know from you know, Dr. Shoemaker's Sicker Quicker, um, if you have new problems, you can absolutely go back. And of course, we also have people that will say, hey, I'm doing well. I don't need to do this anymore. And patient zero did that four times, stopped this for various reasons. It wasn't because she wasn't convinced, but it was because she was traveling one time. She ran out of some things one time. She got a viral infection one time and stopped doing mm. it. And typically it takes seven to 10 days. And of course, if you have another reason to activate your innate immune system, so you get a kidney stone or you get a viral infection, we hear about this all the time, which is why I'm so worried with COVID-19. Uh, in fact, we have actually one of the people who did improve, then got COVID-19, and no surprise, went backwards because the amyloid itself is part of the innate immune system. So as long as you've got ongoing inflammation, you are going to go downhill. So you mentioned this, before we jumped on the call, you mentioned this COVID-19 connection with Alzheimer's. We've we've actually um, done a podcast or two, um, a little bit on, on some of the literature on the relationship. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think it was Jeff Bland talking about the um, mm -hmm. uh, the problem within the problem. Um, can you yeah the pandemic within, within the, the pandemic, pandemic? Can you yeah. speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point, and I think that you know these two really tell you a lot about the other one. And so with COVID-19, of course, it's really revealing how many of us have these comorbidities, hypertension, type two diabetes, obesity, you know, zinc deficiencies. All of these things where we have a poor adaptive system, and it's interesting, this the same thing occurs in both. You tend to have a hyper reaction of the innate system, ongoing inflammation, whereas you have a poor adaptive response. You're not clearing the very things that are triggering this. Of course, in one case, SARS-CoV-2, and in the other case, all sorts of different insults. It's just that, of course, SARS-CoV-2 has compressed the Alzheimer's 20 years down to two weeks. So it's the same sort of story, but much, you know, it played at very rapid speed. Uh, and so as, as Jeff has pointed out, it is a pandemic within a pandemic. Since about the 1970s or so, we've had the pandemic of, of poor metabolic health and glyphosate exposure and, you know, such uh, type two diabetes, obesity, hypertension, all these things, multiple deficiencies, as Dr. Paul Clayton has pointed out, uh, we have nutritional deficiencies much more so than 200 years ago. Uh, we've really got depleted soils. We really do have poor food, um, even in the best situations. And of course, on top of that, we've all got all the stuff with massive amounts of sugar and processed foods and all these things that I didn't worry about when I was a medical student mm -hmm. that I started to realize much later, wait a minute, these things are actually, actually matter. important. <laughs> yeah, they actually do matter. So, so all of these things have contributed. So now we've got this new pandemic within the pandemic of metabolic disease. Hmm. So I think one of the most striking things, at least for people on the medical and science side that are interested in this kind of thing, um, one of the 
was the original paper and then some of the follow-up papers and then certainly the books lay out the five personalities or metabolic subtypes yeah. and we talked about this three years ago when you're on the show but um yeah. you know like these this idea that there's um, sub personalities or subtypes within Alzheimer's right. is something you've talked about uh, quite a bit. Can you kind of review those and say, and just, has there been any, any change in your thinking uh, based on new information in the last few years? Yeah, we're starting to understand these a little better, but you're, you're absolutely right. And this gets to the heart of 21st century medicine versus 20th century medicine. As you know, 20th century medicine, what I was taught was how to make a diagnosis. What is it? You know, is it Alzheimer's? Is it Parkinson's? Is it Lewy body? You know, what is it? And then you write a prescription or you send people to surgery. But of course, in 21st century medicine, it's about larger data sets. It, it's all about why is it? It doesn't help you to say you got Alzheimer's. You want to know why. And I always say, you know, in the 1600s, people died of fever. But now we don't allow people to put a period after fever. It should be fever due to what? Is it tubercle bacillus? You know, is it pneumococcal pneumonia? What is it? The same goes for Alzheimer's. We should never follow the term Alzheimer's with a period. Alzheimer's due to what? What's driving that beautiful neural network to be downsizing? Mm -hmm. And so as we started to look at these larger data sets, which are critical, we, we just can't practice medicine by saying to people, it's here it is, we're going to check your sodium and potassium, and we're going to tell you we don't know what it is and move on. We have to look at the status of their immune systems. We have to look at the pathogen exposure. We have to look at the toxin exposure. We have to look at their mitochondrial status and look at your vascular support and on and on and on, their growth factors, their hormones. All of these things are absolutely critical. And when you do that, what you see is that it fits perfectly with the molecular biology of APP. What we found in years ago in the lab is that APP interacts, for example, with the receptor for nerve growth factor. It has a, a, an indirect interaction, which you can trace, as I mentioned earlier, with estradiol. So estradiol you know, changes gene transcription, and one of the genes impacts the cleavage of APP itself. So all of these things feed into APP. It is literally an integrating sensor. It's looking at all these things, much like you know, your CEO or the president of your country who's deciding, are we going to upsize? Are we going to downsize depending on how things are? And when you look at that, what you see is that there are these different subtypes, as you indicated. So we called type one inflammatory. So these are people where the thing that's driving the APP in the wrong direction is NF-kappa B activation. And that increases your beta and gamma secretases. You're going to cleave your APP and produce the A-beta. And so that's the critical problem to address. You need to know what is causing that inflammation. Is it a leaky gut? Is it periodontitis? Is it chronic sinusitis? Is it metabolic syndrome? You know, what is it? Chronic Lyme disease, what have you. You need to determine that. You need to resolve the inflammation just as we've been taught by Charlie Sirhan. And then you need to prevent further inflammation. Type two is atrophic, a completely different way to get to that same problem. So interestingly, your brain responds with the amyloid and tau in a similar fashion to two completely different insults. In one case, one where you're being assaulted with, with things like, uh, with things like uh, pathogens, and the other one in which you're not, but you are no longer being supported by hormones, growth factors, and nutrients. Mm -hmm. It's still downsizing. So the net effect is we got to downsize. That's type 2 or atrophic or cold Alzheimer's. And then type 1.5, because it's got some of both, is glycotoxic. And there you get both the glycation of proteins that induces inflammation, and you think get things like glyoxals as well, as well as insulin resistance. So now you've lost a critical trophic factor. When we used to grow all the time, grow neurons in Petri dishes, you always had to include insulin in the Petri dish because it's such an important trophic factor for growing neurons. And when you're now resistant to those effects and your IRS-1 has serine and threonine phosphorylation instead of tyrosine phosphorylation, so it's telling you, I am resistant, I am not activating my program when I see insulin, you're in bad shape. And as you know, many, many people have this problem 
as a contributor to Alzheimer's. And then type three is toxic. And as I mentioned, they come in three varieties. It's the inorganics like mercury, like you know, air pollution, things like that. And of course, the fires in California are really concerning me because so many people are going to increase their risk for cognitive decline. Or it's the organics, things like toluene and glyphosate and benzene and things like that. Or it's the biotoxins like trichothecenes and, um, and ochratoxin A and stuff like that. And then type four is vascular. And this is turning out to be much more of a problem than we originally thought. Yeah. A huge issue. Yeah, can you, I, I really like okay. to hear the expansion on this because I'm, I've become more convinced and more convinced that you know, like yeah. this vascular issue is, is really at, um, at least for some people, it's, 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 it's the primary driver and it seems like it's a, emerging as a major um, sort of theory on, 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 on a cause of Alzheimer's itself. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks for asking about that. And so I should just say type five, the last one is traumatic. So let's talk about vascular. I think you and I are in complete agreement. This is a much bigger player than we originally thought. You know, when I was first working on this back in 2011, 2012, I really thought that the dominant problems were going to be inflammation and atrophic, not enough support. Uh, then we found, oh, wait, toxins are really important. And now we're finding, wait a minute, vascular Vascular contribution is incredibly important. And when I was in, when I was back in a neurology residency, we were taught to, to produce a Hotchinsky score. Yeah. And what this was supposed to do, as you know, is tell you who had vascular dementia and who had Alzheimer's disease. Well, of course, it turned out that that was a misunderstanding. Uh, a vascular component to Alzheimer's is incredibly common. And it's really ultimately about energetics. And it comes back to the fact that you have to get your ducks in a row. You can't fail to have any one of the things. You've got to get the ketones and you've got to you know, get, get the energy itself. But then it doesn't work if you don't have the blood flow and the oxygenation to use them. And so you've got to get this, you've got to get all the things to the right places at the right time. And as you mentioned, and as you've been looking into recently, uh, methylene blue is a really interesting potential. It has some promise because it may be able to help us to enhance mitochondrial function. Uh, we will see. I think that a lot of work is going to be done on this. And obviously, uh, Dr. Francisco Gonzalez Lima has done some really exciting work on this. And, you know, we'll see how this goes. And actually, you know, Bruce Ames has, point, has published a, a really nice paper on the potential for this as support for your mitochondria. And of course, it has other nice effects as well, like antioxidant effects uh, and hormetic effects as well. So I think this is really promising. But we now look every person who comes through, what's the likelihood that there is contribution? Do they have a high triglyceride to HDL ratio that puts them at huge risk? Do they have any clinical history that would suggest any sort of thrombotic events or, uh, or even amyloid a compromise of blood vessels? Do they have ongoing inflammation, obviously, which is part of the vascular compromise? Um, do they have, you know, things like fatigue? Do they have problems? We had one really interesting one recently who had problems uh, getting on a plane when he would now be at, at uh, high altitude, uh, would actually get confused. And it turned out that he actually had multiple genomic uh, uh, SNPs that suggested that he was high risk for multiple thrombotic events, and he did very well on uh, pycnogenol and natokinase. So let's just so, let's just double click on that because I think um, that yeah. was pretty um, pretty interesting, but that was pretty technical as well. So basically, what you said is you had somebody with cognitive impairment who was yep. finding that he was getting more confused or cognitively worse on airplanes. You tested, right. you did some advanced genetic testing on him and found out that he had some genes that uh, predisposed him for small blood clots. And when you put him on really over-the-counter, pick nodules at over-the-counter, netokinase, the over-the-counter, essentially supplements, I mean, they're not without risk, but for the right person. So they started like these sort of mini blood thinners and the cognition improved? Absolutely. And, and this is, I, sh I should point out, this is the work uh, from Dr. Ann Hathaway and Dr. Sharon Houseman Cohn. Sharon yeah. uh, started in Telex DNA, and so um, her, uh, you know, her DNA analysis identified these. Uh, Dr. Ann Hathaway treated. So this is what I'm pointing out here is we're learning from people like this. What are the critical players 
uh, that may have been missed in earlier evaluations. Mm, that's awesome. You mentioned within the vascular uh, system, you mentioned mitochondria. Do you do you see those two things as, as one? We've had a couple of guests on Richard Isaacson, and you know certainly um, there's other people, um, Russell Swerdlow, Vijay, there's many, many sort of um, members of this mito, mito mafia, the mitochondrial mafia. Do you, uh, yeah. where do you stand with, you know, sort of assessment? It's a tricky thing. Assessments of mitochondria, is that part of the vascular contribution or is this, is this fit somewhere else in, in um, these subtype, metabolic subtypes or personalities of, of Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's a really good point because it can be in different subtypes. Um, you know, if you don't support it enough with the right trophic factors, you're not going to get a good outcome either. But here's the thing. All of this comes back to what does it take to make a neural network function optimally? And as you know, there are very high metabolic rates. I mean, the brain is using a, a, large, a, a large part of the circulation, even though it's a tiny part of your overall body. And so, yes, these are intimately related. Now, of course, you can have a mitochondrial disease, for example, uh, by having specific mutations in mitochondrial DNA without having any problem uh, with, uh, with blood flow. But the common problem in people who have Alzheimer's disease is that they're, they're not supporting their mitochondria. And yes, they can have complex one. Anything that inhibits complex four, for example, can be associated with Alzheimer's. And in general, as we as has been published repeatedly, complex one inhibition is more associated with Parkinson's disease. So just to just to clarify for the audience, complexes, we're talking about the electron transport chain within the mitochondria that make energy, right? So there are different sort of stops along the chain and complex one, complex four are two examples of, of that. Am I correct there, Dale? Absolutely. And of course, uh, any place along that chain that you interrupt uh, through various toxins, through various mutations, uh, through you know not supplying enough of anything that's required, um, you're not going to get the, 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 you know, the uh, optimal output. Uh, and so the point here is that for many of the people with cognitive changes, one of the most common contributors is suboptimal support of your energetics. So it's not getting the oxygen you need. As, as you well know, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. You go right down the chain from you know, one to three to four, or from two to three to four, uh, and uh, then you end up with uh, reducing the oxygen to water. Um, and this is what gives you this tremendous amount of energy that you can get from eating food. Uh, and, uh, and while you've got to you know, breathe the air that you have to, to, uh, to make that work optimally. So anything that is interrupting that, and as I said, the common things are you're not actually getting the blood to get there because you have atherosclerosis, uh, or you're actually uh, getting it there, but you don't have the appropriate oxygenation because you have sleep apnea or because you're, you've got lung disease or what have you. Um, or you are getting the oxygen there and you are getting the blood there, but you don't actually have uh, a combustible substrate like ketones. So you're having a problem with those. So you really have to do get all, you know, you really have to get all your ducks in a row to get best outcomes. And yes, you're right. There can be separately mitochondrial disease per se, but it doesn't seem to be the rate limiting step in most of the people with cognitive changes. Interesting. So you, you also, you, um, one of the, my favorite parts of the new book was the treatment that you did, uh, talking about the keto flex 12, three diet right. and what that means. Um, and since we're talking about mitochondria and we're talking about energy production, we've talked about glycotoxicity and, and brain energy. And, um, can you explain what, you know, generally speaking, what the keto flex diet is and, and why ketone energy is so important and maybe what ketone it is, but uh, why ketone yeah. energy is so important in Alzheimer's and cognition? Absolutely. It's, it's a great point. And of course, you know, prior to all the craziness, the crazy uh, standard American diet, et cetera, um, you know, many of us were going in and out of ketosis all the time. We were metabolically flexible. That is to say, you could burn glucose or you could burn ketones and your brain would be very happy on either of those. And of course, now we're in a scenario where most of us are burning glucose, but not ketones most of our lives. We don't have these periods of ketosis as much 
as is typical. We are not metabolically flexible. And as you and I talked about earlier, um, we actually have some insulin resistance. So you can, you look at the PET scan, you can actually see that there is reduced ability to utilize glucose in both the temporal and parietal region. So literally, you are starving your brain because the brain can burn one of two things. It can burn ketones, which are from the breakdown of fats, or it can burn glucose. But if you're not burning glucose because you have insulin resistance and you're not getting ketones, you are literally starving your brain, which is what we all, why we always suggest, hey, this is an emergency. Get your ketone level up immediately. You can use exogenous ketones if you want. Over the months, let's get you into some mild endogenous ketosis because there are advantages to that. But initially, this is an emergency. We need to bridge that gap because your brain is starving for nutrition. Let's, you know, let's fix that with the ketones. And of course, these are made in your liver and transported as BHV, beta-hydroxybutyrate, one of the three major ketones, along with acetone and acetoacetate. Um, and that's these are transported from the blood into your brain. And your brain actually does take uh, some time to adapt to using them, uh, which is another reason you want to get started early. But ultimately, it does very well. And as uh, Stephen Kinane has shown with his research, you can bridge that gap quite nicely uh, with a few millimolar uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate with a few millimolar of these ketones. They can be very powerful in providing the very energy that you have failed to get for years as you're developing this. And as you know, people who are APOE4 positive will often have these changes that indicate a decreased utilization of glucose in their 20s, in their late 20s. Uh, so this is an ongoing problem often for years before there is recognized cognitive decline. So the KetoFlex diet that you indicated, we call it KetoFlex 12-3. And, you know, I am not a nutritionist by training. So all we're trying to do is optimize your biochemistry and your neurochemistry. So all we're trying to do is say, what does it take for best synaptogenesis? What does it take for best synaptic performance and for best cognitive performance? And it does take a combination of the things that we put into the KetoFlex 12-3 diet. So you want to get in yourself into mild ketosis, typically between 1.0 and 4.0 millimolar beta-hydroxybutyrate, or if you like a uh, breathalyzer, like the one made, for example, by Biosense, uh, then you want to get above 7 on the ACEs, uh, preferably even above 10, and that's an acetone uh, evaluation. Um, mm -hmm. you, want to get, uh, you want to get yourself a high-fiber, plant-rich, uh, mildly ketogenic diet, um, that has high good fats, intermediate protein, and very low carbohydrate, and hopefully no simple carbs, uh, because they really interfere with cognitive improvement. And of course, these have been reported again and again. Um, there's the Mediterranean diet. We disagree a little bit with that one, because that one uses some grains and things like that. And we suggest that you want to stay away from gluten, dairy, and grains. And focus on if you're going to have some fish and meat, great. Uh, you know, have some wild caught smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovy, sardines, herring, not the high mercury fish. Keep your mercury level low. Uh, and if you're going to have beef, great. Have some uh, some nice grass fed beef. And if you're going to have chicken, have some pastured chicken, pastured eggs. One of the biggest issues this comes up, as you know, is that so many of us have a diet that's deficient in choline. And of course, pastured eggs help, mm -hmm. liver helps, organ meats, things like that, uh, oysters, all these things help, and a number of vegetables as well. So uh, you want to make sure you get around 550 milligrams of choline per day. It's critical to make the acetylcholine that is low in Alzheimer's disease. So we want to keep your choline levels up high enough. So that's the keto flex part. You can, you know, if you want to be a vegetarian, fine. If you want to be a a, uh, you want to be a, an omnivore, that's fine too, but just make sure that you get um, the ketone levels there. You make sure that you get plenty of fiber, at least 30 grams a day. And then the 12-3 the part is a minimum of 12 hours of fasting. Fasting is critical for getting best outcomes. It's critical for everything from hypertension uh, to, uh, you know, to, to reducing or increasing your ketone levels, all of these things, inducing autophagy, all these things. Uh, the fasting part is important. 
Um, and then the 12 three, the three part is before bed. You don't want to bump up your your insulin. So you want to have a uh, and you want to eat the latest three hours before you retire. Okay, excellent. That's um, yeah, I really thought uh, that was one of my favorite parts of the new book. I wanted to roll to an, another part uh, in the book uh, because it's I would say this is one of the areas where your work and work of some of your colleagues is can be considered more controversial. Um, remember when you won the Dr. Oz show, there was like the controversial doctor. That was, I think we had a good chuckle about that is on the Dr. Oz show of all things. So, but, right. but uh, I think the point really is that this, this, this notion of detoxification still is a little bit um, out there for some people, right? It's hard for them to get their minds around, not only because of the usual, you know, my doctor said it's not a real thing or whatever, but, um, but because of um, things like wildfires and um, what happened in Flint, Michigan, there, there is sort of more uh, awareness uh, that we live in, in a, somewhat of a, a toxic world where, there's, where we've, we've cr- sort of created more of a toxic environment than we had 20 years ago and certainly we had 50 years ago and so on. But it's still an area I think it's hard for some people to get their minds around. Right, this detoxification issue. Can you, because um, you, you, you've made the point many, many times over that the uh, type three, right, these metabolic, these personalities of Alzheimer's, the type three, the toxic type are some of the most difficult to treat. We've definitely seen that in, 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 my, in my experience treating patients. It's definitely the case. Um, and often even in cases where it's like runs throughout the whole family. Uh, and these people are not ApoE fours, they're ApoE three threes typically. Can you like talk a little bit about detoxification? You mentioned a tool, a 23andMe um, uh, browse raw data tool. Um, just just wax a little bit um, on detoxification and, uh, and and what that means and why it might be so problematic um, why in, in, in treatment. Absolutely. And of course, uh, you know, you and I were taught in medical school that these toxic diseases are things that is, you know, striking toxicity. You know, you've got severe mercury toxicity, that sort of thing, and you're losing your hair and stuff like that. Um, They really didn't teach us nearly enough about chronic mild toxicity. And of course, Dr. Joe Pizzorno has pointed this out repeatedly. We are exposed to so much. And it's interesting to me that there has been such uh, recalcitrance, uh, there is such uh, you know, we've kind of had to drive, dra- drag people kicking and screaming into the 21st century to recognize that this has been an issue. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're coming directly from the lab. We're simply asking the question, what are the things that drive your APP into this synaptoclastic signaling that is associated with Alzheimer's? In other words, the thing that's telling your APP you're going to go on the side of downsizing, you're gonna make the amyloid, you're gonna make the very things that downsize the connections. And if you simply just follow the pathways, then you can see that absolutely one of the critical ones is toxicity and these different types of toxins, as I mentioned earlier. Um, And what's surprising to me is many people who are experts in this area simply say, we're not used to hearing this, and so we reject the notion. Well, wait a minute, I mean, you're not making anyone better. So isn't it possible that one of the reasons that you're not making anyone better <laughs> is that you're not looking for this and you're not treating it? No, we, just, we don't believe this. And so you really have to, you have to look at this. And, and when we, again, the, you know, the proof of the pudding is to see that you, can, that you can find the toxins and that when you address them, people get better. And they have multiple mechanisms, as you know, uh, and there's a whole, there's a whole field unto itself because you have toxins that affect your immune system. Of course, you know, mycotoxins, the molds are trying to carve out a niche to live in your body and you're pretty good at getting rid of them. So they have to make the toxins that affect your immune system to say, please allow us to live here. So they actually give you a degree of immunodeficiency. Uh, They, you know, they're making toxins that affect your nervous system as well. Uh, All these things are absolutely critical, and they do affect the same pathways that we look at in the molecular species that are driving Alzheimer's disease. So I do agree that this is a critical thing to look at. 
we're getting better and better ways to measure them. But as you know, there's a lot of controversy about just the measurement of mycotoxins in urine. Some people believe that that is worthless, and some people believe that it's absolutely essential to look at these things. Uh, what, so, what do you believe in terms of urine mycotoxins? Here's the Currently. thing. I believe, it, I believe it's with, with the appropriate other tests and clinical diagnosis, it's the best thing we have for knowing whether the toxins are there. Now, again, I understand some of these people are getting them through what they've eaten. So you know, maybe the best way is to eat some things for a few days that you know are not going to have mold in them and then recheck. But um, as others have said, uh, Dr. Thrasher, the late Dr. Thrasher, mm -hmm. pointed out that uh, when you see people who have toxicity, you pick it up in the urine, and as they do better, the urine levels are typically disappearing over time. Uh, so I actually think it's the best thing we have. Unfortunately, we don't have something better. Now, again, in the right setting, you also want to know, are they responding the way someone should? Do they have a high TGF beta 1? Do they have a high MMP9 or C4A, things like that? These are blood and tests. Then, yeah. Yeah. These are, yeah, exactly. So do you, do you have, I, I'm suspicious if they have one without the other. Uh, and then do you have a, a clinical course? Do you have exposure? Do you have a high ERMI score at your home, for example, or your school? Do you have a history of water damage, of working or living in a water damaged building? And then do you have a presentation? These people, as I mentioned earlier, tend to look different. Uh, if this is a 52-year-old woman who started with depression and now is having executive dysfunction uh, without major memory problems at the beginning, a, a so-called non-amnestic presentation with a high ERMI score, a high C4A, and a high uh, trichothesines in the urine, that really convinces me, yes, we've got to look carefully at the toxic. If this is someone who is uh, 69 and who has an HSCRP of 10, uh, you know, and a leaky gut and metabolic syndrome and all that, and then happens to have minimal bump in their uh, trichothecenes or their, you know, their ochratoxin A or gliotoxin. So these are mycotoxins, mold-related species, okay. Yeah, various things like that. And the C4A is uh, 1,500, um, then I'm not nearly as concerned. So I think, again, it's, it is a tool in your chest that you can use to look at with your clinical judgment to understand who is likely to have the problem. And as Neil Nathan has pointed out, the key here is to determine what the, what the priority is. Uh, one of the things that's been really striking to me is there are doctors who most of their patients with cognitive decline get better, and there are doctors who almost none of their patients with cognitive decline. It's very much like surgery. It's hard, and people are learning, and they're learning things that work best for them and when to treat and how to treat, and prioritizing things is critical. If this is a person who has mostly a toxic presentation, then you need to focus on that. If this is a person with mostly a non-toxic presentation, then you wanna focus on that. And I see this all the time where people will focus on the wrong thing mm. and not get very good outcomes. Right, right, yeah, that makes sense. I, I wanna um, shift just a, a bit into something that's maybe softer for a second, but um, I'm just curious to know your thoughts about it because um, you know you come from like you've mentioned several times, and we all know uh, you came from the lab really with years and years of experience in the lab, really looking um, you know with literally with a microscope at things. And um, there was a recent article that stated that it was apathy, right, as opposed to what's commonly known as a sort of depression that can. Uh, tilt people or predispose them um, uh, as a major risk factor for developing Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, our brilliant colleague, Dr. Majid Fatui, has published on um, increasing the areas in the brain, the hippocampus, uh, hippocampi, um, the memory centers, so to speak, of the brain with a focused program, right, that, that includes several things. Uh, but one of them is goal-oriented coaching or psychotherapy. I think it was a psychotherapist in his paper from a few years back. But do you? How do you? Um, how do you deal with this piece of it? You know, how do you recommend this piece of it, or where do you see successes where people are just like apathetic, or you know, they they have that sort of um, flat affect? Uh, how do you 
um, see people being most motivated? Yeah, that's such a good point because, uh, of course, I want to see everything quantified. You know, I, I want to see it in mathematics. I want to make sure that th things go from, you know, four to 10, that sort of thing. And so, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, something that's a little different, a softer science, uh, you know, is important. And one of the very first people who ever came to see me, family brought her to me, and she had that kind of typical vacant stare. Uh, and she was, you know, had very, very addressable things. Uh, she had a homocysteine of 24. You know, she had a low vitamin D. Um, you know, she had all these things that were very clear uh, that could, could be addressed. And so we started by addressing this. Um, and she came back about three months later with her family. And she actually slapped me on the leg. And she said, hey, doc, I'm doing better. And I thought, wow. I mean, she was, she was literally <laughs> a anymore. different. Yeah, she was a different human being. She didn't stare off. She was so much more engaging. It was it was like talking to a person instead of a patient with Alzheimer's. And then over the next few months, um, she, her you know her family started telling me you know she's not doing as well, and she just she became apathetic and and she basically said to me you know I don't want to do the exercise and I don't want to get rid of the sweets that I love and I don't want to do uh, lots of parts of this program and I'm traveling too much and I you know don't I don't want to think about this. And so actually I had um, my daughter, uh, who was just starting as a health coach, work with her. And she mm. came back and she said, Dad, this woman wants to die. And I said, what yeah. do you mean? And she said, this particular woman, the love of her life was her, the prize was, was her single grandchild. And she had such a wonderful relationship. And the grandchild had moved away and oh. really had very little interaction with the grandmother anymore. And she just didn't care. Uh, and so... You're absolutely right. It is so critical to get that feeling that, yes, I, you know, the will to survive and the will to, to do better and the will to enjoy life. And so uh, this is a huge issue. And talking to people, I think this is where you have to be a psychologist. You have to understand what drives these people. Is it, you know, what gives them joy? Is it their relationships? Is it their you know, piano playing? Is it the walks in the forest? Uh, you know, what is it that really makes these people uh, enjoy life? And that is absolutely an important part of this. And we try to address this in people. And uh, you know, Julie talks about this as well. Uh, and, you know, this idea that she points out about, you know, get busy living or get busy dying, which, which uh, yeah. came from the Shawshank Redemption, which sure. I always thought of. It's, it's a very hard line. It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to hear someone say. Uh, but I, I totally understand, and she's absolutely right about it. And so I think it's helpful, and I've always found it to be important. Is the family involved? You know, is, the, is there a health coach involved? Does the person want to do this? And I tell them, we can't make you better if you don't want to be better. However, once they start improving, they start realizing there's a lot to live for. And hey, you know, I've been told that things are not going to go well, and yet here I am doing well. For, and then even for, as I say, over eight years in some cases. So as people begin to understand that, I think we're going to get rid of this so-called nocebo effect. This has been the problem that we as neurologists have told people, forget it, uh, you're going to die. It's you know, such a horrible thing to hear. There's nothing we can do. And unfortunately, as I mentioned in the first book, we neurologists aren't known for our good bedside manner. Uh, you know, we, tend to, we tend to be more scientific and less personal. Uh, and so we need to change that. And we need to be able to talk to people about joy and get them involved. This is, you know, this really does take a network to get best outcomes. Yeah, I think, I think that is changing. I think, you know, largely due to your work, uh, a few other people, but, um, you know, I think in the academic community, you might get, uh, less credit than, than, than you deserve. Um, but, uh, I, I'm, pushing the conversation upstream as opposed to let's just wait until we got to take the keys away from grandpa uh, or dad or spouse or whoever it is. Yeah. Um, and I, and the, I do think that there are two things, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just no, to say, but I think there are two things that haven't been used enough in previous illnesses, and these are going to be critical in curing Alzheimer's. And one is social networks. They are going to be critical. People share information. You know about APOE4.info that yeah. uh, Julie Gregory founded very helpful and so many people on that that are looking at that and then the other one is computation uh, you know it's interesting to me that you know Google knows where you shop 
They know a lot about you. Facebook knows all about your life. Why aren't we using these same sorts of things instead of for better advertising to look at the many, many critical variables that it's going to take to get best outcomes for this? And so this is going to help us to study huge data sets and to say, ah, we're seeing patterns using artificial intelligence that the people who did, you know, A, B, C, Q, and Z did better than the people who did, you know, A, B, C, D, and F. So, okay, great. This will help tease out what are the critical players here. And so I'm really enthusiastic about those things as being part of future medicine. Yeah. The, um, you have a clinical trial going on right now using, you know, this approach. Uh, anything you can, um, I know sometimes the uh, institutional review boards have uh, everything under wraps and you're not allowed to talk about it, but uh, can you give us any updates at the time of this recording? We're in uh, mid-September 2020. Uh, yeah. Any trial updates? Well, what I can say is, you know, we started to try to do this in 2011. We were turned down because, quote, this is not the way you do trials with multivariable approaches. Uh, we were turned down. So that's why we published the anecdotal reports that we got criticized for, you know, why are they anecdotal? Why aren't they a trial? Well, because we had to get the anecdotes to get the trial. And my argument was, isn't something better than nothing? Yep. Uh, and so, okay, then, then uh, we tried again in 2018. We were turned down again in 2018, again, multivariable trial, which why would you do this? So finally in 2019, we were approved and this is on clinicaltrials.gov. So it's a registered trial. Uh, we're doing this uh, we're very excited about it. It's the first trial uh, that is ever, instead of predetermining what the treatment's going to be, which if you think about it, makes no sense. You know, why would you treat everybody the same? Instead, we look for each person, what are all the contributors, and then we address those contributors. And I hope that that will be the way of the future for all clinical trials. And I'm just really excited to be doing this with three absolutely outstanding integrated physicians, uh, Dr. Kat Toops, Dr. Anne Hathaway, and Dr. Deborah Gordon. Uh, they've just been doing a fantastic job, and we're working, uh, we're supported by, uh, by the Evan Thea Foundation and Diana Merriam, so, so excited about that. And we're working with a wonderful CRO called QuestGen and Mike Jarrett and his group. Uh, this mm -hmm. will be finished in December uh, and uh, should be published next year, so I'm very enthusiastic about that. And we look really forward to... Um... I've seen those results. Those are really uh, important uh, to, to many, many people around the world. Um, Thanks very much, Nate. Can you uh, highlight anything else from the book um, that you feel like is important that we haven't really touched on? Uh, yeah. So we talk, We have a whole separate part in the book about supplements, and we know how. And we tried to go at this in a different way. Instead of saying, uh, you know, what does supplement X do for you, we tried to go from the user side and say okay, if I want to enhance X, if I want to bring down my homocysteine, what things can you use to help me? If I want to improve my memory, what's the set of things that can be helpful to me? If I want to improve my insulin sensitivity, what is that set of things and where do I get them and things like that? Uh, so we try to go again from the user side and make this very practical. Uh, and then we also have a troubleshooting section. We also have a section on updating. Here, here are the things we've learned since the last book. Uh, what are the things that have turned out to be you know, more important than we thought? Things like that. So to try to give, you know, here are the new pieces because, of course, you know, all these things are changing over time. Awesome. And then, um, what's next for you, Dale? What uh, what's uh, what's exciting to you on the horizon here? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, that uh, we're trying to understand, uh, you know, how can we make people better who are later in the course? Of course, we like so that everybody comes in early. And that's a, a huge issue. But getting larger data sets, as you know, I'm working uh, as a consultant for Apollo Health, and they are specifically writing code to get us larger data sets so that we can look at all these critical variables that are important to get us best outcomes. I think that's the way the field is going to move forward. And then secondly, with the idea that every one of these neurodegenerative diseases fundamentally represents a mismatch between the chemistry that's required for support and the chemistry that's required for demand. And so for all of these, if we can understand their unique biochemistries, we should be able to address each one of these. And we have something called the ARC project, where we've started to now address additional people. We have people with macular degeneration, for example. We'd like to make, you know, make this, uh, modify this so that we have something for Parkinson's, Lewy body, vascular dementia, 
uh, all of these different things, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, PSP, CBD, all of these things, the fundamental notion is the same, the chemistry is different. And so I think that's that's the future, that's where things are going. And then the next thing is um, finishing up the next book, which will be out next year, um, which is oh, about wow. the first survivors. And so I'm really enthusiastic about all these different survivors who are writing their own stories. You know, this is what I was told, because this gives you a clear input for here's what worked for me and here's what worked yes. for this person. And I think ultimately hearing that other people, that it's not hopeless, is so critical for people, especially starting out. Dale, are you interested in um, trying the protocol on mid to late stage dementia residents living in long-term care in a controlled environment to see if there's any impact? Well, it, it, we've, had a, we've had some people who've reported improvements in those areas, so I'm interested in it. Uh, and it would obviously we'd have to sit down and uh, I would want to, you know, you want to start with a few people. Let's, let's see, you know, get, get the anecdotes and see, okay, what seems to be best. I think it's so important. I think this is where a lot of us have made big mistakes in the past. Let's spend $50 million on a phase three yeah. trial, because if we can just get this to work, it doesn't have to work well. If it just slows the decline a little, which if you think about it, that's not the goal. We're trying to make people better, not just make them worse more slowly. You know, then we can sell billions and billions of dollars worth of a drug. I, I think we get farther when we take small groups first, and then let's look to see if we can make it work there. Then we can expand it to the large groups and really get the best outcomes. Absolutely. Well, it's a, an honor and a pleasure to know you, um, follow your work. It's a, it's an inspiration to many, many people uh, that you really don't even, you probably don't even know how much, although I'm sure you told it uh, from time to time. But uh, thank you so much for being with us and spending the time. Thanks, Nate, for all your great work. Uh, it's an honor to know you as well. And obviously, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. I'm getting older. And so it's going to be great people like you who are going to take this forward and uh, change the world. So thanks for your interest. Thank you so much. Nate. Right, thanks, Nate. So that's our episode. I hope it was useful to you. Check out the show notes on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. If you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comments section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. If you have questions or comments, connect with us on social media. Finally, to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. Thanks. Talk to you next time.